Hello, my name is Jessica Polka. I'm executive director of ASAP Bio, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to Feedback ASAP, a meeting held in conjunction with the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative, DORA, and HHMI. We're all here today to talk about how to grow a culture of constructive preprint feedback. But before we get started, I have a few housekeeping announcements. First, please do keep your microphones muted to reduce background noise. Um, and we may take action to mute attendees to reduce this if possible. Um, all the plenary sessions in the meeting are gonna be recorded and posted publicly. So please be mindful of this. If you don't wish to appear on video, please keep your video turned off during these plenary sessions. We will have breakout sessions later in the meeting, uh, which we do not plan to publicly post, although some breakout facilitators may record those sessions for their own note-keeping purposes. Um, I would also like to invite you to submit questions via the chat for the speakers. And we're gonna be going through those and selecting questions that moderators will pose to the speakers in that fashion. Finally, um, we are expecting everyone to adhere to ASAP IO's code of conduct and community guidelines. In brief, um, please be respectful, use professional inclusive language, value and respect different viewpoints, um, including constructive feedback, it's certainly germane to the theme of this meeting. Um, encourage diversity and share information and resources that are relevant to um, the broader goal of encouraging public feedback on preprints. Now, it's my pleasure to introduce James Frazier, ASAP Bio's Vice President and a Professor at UCSF, who will tell us a bit more about the goals of the meeting. Hi, and uh, welcome everyone. Uh, ASAP Bio has a long tradition of trying to encourage folks to push the envelope of accelerating their uh, scholarly communication. And now that we have a great culture, still growing culture of posting preprints, I think it's time to set our sights on another aspect of scholarly communication, which is the public review and feedback on those uh, preprints. So our goal for this meeting is really to figure out what that looks like and discuss with a group of stakeholders and interested parties about what are the benefits and also be aware of some of the risks or potential downsides uh, of increasing uh, public review and feedback on, on preprints. One of the things we really wanna take away from this is a, a plan. Uh, we want to be able to share tangible actions. I like to think of them as experiments. Many of us, most of us are scientists. How can we experiment with different forms of feedback to try to figure out how we want to move scholarly communication forward uh, in the 21st century in the most equitable and, and rapid way uh, possible? Uh, and so with that uh, sort of broad overview of the goals of the meeting in mind, I want to advance the slide deck. Uh, and, and just show you how we're going to uh, go about this today, the, the program uh, that is planned. I'm gonna start by asking why this is important. Uh, and then based on lessons learned from uh, advancing the cause of preprints in general, talk about how institutional support can play a role in increasing uh, the value uh, of uh, preprint feedback in the eyes of, of institutions and those who hold purse strings and, and careers in their, in their balance. Then we ask, what can you do? Uh, this is when we're gonna start talking about some of those experiments uh, that folks can do in their, in their own hands with their own uh, time and effort. Uh, and we'll do that in a series of breakout sessions that, uh, that Jessica and Prachi will give incredibly detailed instructions on how to join. So don't panic yet. You will get to join the breakout session of your dreams if you follow the instructions that they give. I think one of the things that's so important about uh, our meetings is that we do a really great job, thanks to a framework that Jessica and Arachi and, and Victoria lay down of collecting what are all these ideas so that we can evaluate them and start experimenting them with them more in the public. And we'll have a great uh, report out and wrap up session uh, before we break at the end of the day. Next slide. All right, we're going to start with uh, asking this broad question, um, what is the value of public preprint feedback? And I'll introduce our moderator, Keith Yamamoto. 
Keith is a colleague at UCSF, uh, and I've long admired Keith's devotion to pushing the envelope in many respects, not just scholarly communication. He's currently the Vice Chancellor for Science Policy and Strategy at UCSF, and his research lab has been renowned for figuring out many fundamental aspects of eukaryotic gene regulation, a field, you know, he almost, you know, almost can be credited for founding basically as a, as a graduate student, you know, in his, as his early career days. Uh, he's a big advocate of sharing data and has a huge vision uh, for how sharing can ultimately impact both basic science and patients. And I think he's a great choice to moderate this panel because I've seen firsthand as I was coming up the ranks, how important it is to have the backing and wisdom of true luminaries like Keith as we collectively push the envelope. So please join me in welcoming my colleague and friend, Keith Yamamoto. Jamie, thank you very much. Uh, this is great. And thanks everyone out there for, for joining this important um, uh, meeting. I'm really looking forward to the discussion and to the, to the concrete plans that are going to come out uh, at the end. So this is very exciting. Um, uh, in this first session, we've assembled a, uh, a, a, an outstanding uh, panel of people that, that I'll have them introduce themselves other than just naming them at this point. But when they do, you will see that um, uh, one of the powers of the, the panel that has been assembled here is that they um, uh, really represent uh, different disciplines, uh, different career stages, different types of institutions. So when we try to consider the value of public preprint uh, feedback, um, uh, getting uh, these different perspectives coming in from different angles is really critical. Um, and, and so I, I'm really looking forward to, to our discussion. Uh, let me start by just um, uh, asking, uh, and, and so the, the three panelists are Amanda Hag, um, uh, Chris Jackson, and, and Prachi Avasti. Um, and, and let me actually kick off by uh, uh, asking Prachi just to give a general, her general perspective uh, for, I think, setting the framework for, the, for this uh, panel on the value of uh, preprint review. Thanks so much, Keith. Um, you know, thanks, thanks to everyone for being here. Um, I'll just give you a, a brief introduction. My name is Prashi Avasti. I'm an associate professor of biochemistry and cell biology at the Geisel School of Medicine at Dartmouth College. I'm also the current president of ASAP Bio. And I just wanted to sort of start by sharing why I think public review has a lot of proximal benefits for both authors and readers, and also has a lot of long-term benefits for science. Um, so for authors, I think the most obvious benefit is that uh, public review really helps to increase the rigor of our work when many more people with varied expertise can see and, and comment on it. Um, and another benefit is really related to transparency. I mean, I think we are all familiar, familiar with um, what can sometimes feel like unfair or private reviews on our on our papers. And this is one of the reasons that many are sometimes uncomfortable with public review because we sort of imagine our, our worst and most unfair criticism being made public and then damaging our reputations in the long term. But I would argue that when unfair criticism remains hidden and used just for a binary accept reject decision at journals, we as authors have no recourse but to go to another journal um, and you know, subject ourselves to another round of review, um, some of uh, which may not be you know, totally on base. Um, so public review has has a, a number of different author benefits here, which includes um, that reviewers, A, may be uh, less likely to include inappropriate or personal criticism in a review that they know is going to be public. Um, reviews um, that are factually inaccurate can be openly rebutted by an author. Um, and then having you know, open reviews available and reusable by all can reduce potentially rounds of additional you know, secret review. Um, so that's just that's just for the authors alone. But what about for the readers? Um, you know, this is this one is the easiest thing I think to understand is, um, you know, if you're reading something outside of your field, you may want to know what an expert thinks about the work. And indeed, this is a, a reason that a lot of people tend to value, you know, peer reviewed articles. Um, a great example is COVID preprints, for example. Um, you know, if you have an example of extremely important work, work that's important to release as early as possible, but for which misinformation carries significant costs, um, you know, we obviously want public review in this case. We, you know, and I think when we know that we want to know what, you know, experts think about work that's not necessarily in our field, you know, we can't say that we want open review of other people's work, but we don't want open review of our own work, right? <laughs> that doesn't um, really make sense. Um, and then, you know, lastly, I would say that, you know, public review allows papers to have, be a more faithful record 
to the sort of current state of science in a field. You know, peer review by two or three secret people is not really a marker for truth, right? Um, you know, public review allows many more people to participate, which is a feature, not a bug. Um, you know, today, the, the type of interdisciplinary, um, you know, research that we are doing can't be really rigorous, re rigorously vetted by a very narrow set of, of people and expertise. Um, and gatekeeping who can comment on the basis of career stage rather than, you know, the quality of the actual review is bad for everyone. So, you know, instead of letting the important criticism or new information be hidden under the stamp of a journal name, um, you know, open evaluations can surface issues that come up you know, from a broader set, set of experts over time. And this allows the work um, and, and current opinions of it to be visible rather than providing sort of a false sense of accuracy or truth um, to scientists and the public. So I'll just close by say that, saying that ultimately, I think public reviews have a lot of benefits for authors and readers to improve fairness and scientific rigor, but it's also better for science and for the public under, understanding of it. So I just wanted to sort of set that stage and, um, you know, uh, set why I think this is such an important topic for us to discuss today. Thanks. Great. Thank you. That's that's terrific. And it does really set the stage and, and frames, uh, I, I think, in a way, not only this session, but but the, the meeting overall. When I when I look, you know, kind of look through um, the the agenda for this meeting, um, I really see the overarching goal of it uh, to be nothing less than to change the culture of criticism. Uh, yes, today we're focusing on the re review of preprints. Kind of the front end of that process, uh, but but really to, the goal I think is to really elevate the value of criticism for all stakeholders, uh, authors, reviewers, uh, the scientific community, science, uh, society, um, uh, and and so I think that we're we we have a we have a big issue in front of us, but one that can have really great impact if we if we can uh, make some progress. Um, so the session uh, why public preprint review. Uh, you know, we really want to consider the value of, of uh, public review of preprints at the, on a social and individual level um, uh, and, and uh, frame some of the challenges and, and discuss uh, the potential mitigation strategies for overcoming those barriers or challenges. Uh, so, as I said, I think the, the, the power of this panel is, is its diversity in, in uh, representing different disciplines, career stages, different types of institutions. So, so let me let me just kick off with just asking each of the panel members uh, to to uh, just give us your kind of personal experiences in giving or receiving uh, uh, public uh, preprint feedback. Um, and and as you kick off your answer, as I said, if you just uh, expand on the introduction, say um, uh, where your what your career stage is, where your institution is, some maybe some a word about your discipline. Um, and uh, let's kick off with with Chris Jackson. Uh, hi, yeah, thanks, uh, Keith, and thanks for the invitation, everybody, for, for, to come to this, uh, this webinar. So, yeah, I'm, I'm Chris Jackson. I'm a professor of um, geoscience at the University of Manchester, having spent 17 years at Imperial College in London. Um, I'm also um, co-founder of Earth Archive, which was the first uh, preprint server for Earth and Planetary Sciences. So, um, I'm really new to the preprint game, if you will. I'm kind of three or four years into this. So, I'm kind of been learning a huge amount from BioArchive and other existing uh, preprint servers. So I guess I'm here to learn as much as to contribute my view on preprints, because I think we want to get some of those foundational things right as we start to move earth and planetary sciences into being active and, and widespread users of preprints. I think Pete's direct question to me was, what's my experience with, I guess, with fe preprint feedback and so on? And I guess I view preprint feedback as being, I think we need to kind of reimagine it as almost being just, I think firstly, feedback is better than criticism <laughs> as a word, but I, but I think we need to reframe it as being an, as a logical extension of feedback that you would wish to get if you give a presentation at a conference. So many of us really want that illustrious speaker slot at a conference, or they want to get the poster slot, or you want to do this and that. And at that stage, you're really keen to get feedback on your work from the community, often the very public forum, remember, because then we can fold that into our ongoing work and hopefully then um, there's a bit of feedback coming from somewhere. Um, it might be just at my end. Um, oh, there it's gone. Um, 
we, you know, we, we want to get that feedback, so we really crave it. But then suddenly there's this flip, isn't there? As soon as we go into the publication stage, and then it all gets locked in, as Prashi said, in the journal, you know, the singular journal experience, we then have a very different emotional response to the feedback, the, the public nature of that feedback and the depth of that feedback, even though in my mind, the argument I make is that I think it should be an extension of that interaction that goes on as we're producing our work, not simply as an outcome of at the end of the work. So that's, that's what I think, Keith. Unmute. Um, sorry. Thank you, Chris. Um, uh, that's very, very useful. So let's jump to the other end of, of the kind of uh, career stage spectrum and, and, uh, and hear a little bit from Amanda. Yeah. Hi. Thanks, you know, for the invitation um, to speak today, too. I'm Amanda Hagee. I am an assistant professor at uh, University of North Dakota, and um, I kind of got involved with, you know, preprint type stuff um, into my postdoc. So I was one of the was one of the first people recruited for writing for prelates um, when that started in 2018, I'm pretty sure. <laughs> um, and then um, kind of moving into my own independent position, my first corresponding author paper um, was the survey of the academic job market. Um, and we wanted to purposely as a group really do that um, publicly open access, all the you know kind of things we're talking about today very purposefully um, to get that kind of feedback. Um, from everyone going into it because it's a very broad topic and very sensitive topic for a lot of people um, in that regard. Um, so that's been my experience from both with writing for prelites, kind of providing that um, public review in, I would say, kind of a formalized way with writing those blog posts. There you kind of have, you know, that institution that the company of biologists that support, you know, there's a name to it. I'm not just like gotten a blog um, on my own for that. But then also with receiving my own feedback from multiple sites, we had a prelate written about us and some of those formalized things, as well as a lot of Twitter feedback for things. And I think going along with what Chris said with, you know, I also view it as like this extension of that conference conversation or that lab meeting conversation where you're getting that feedback and, you know, hopefully it's, you know, it's all constructive and professional and those kind of things. And I also think this, it's an extension of some of the conversations we're having um, on Twitter, on social media and those kind of things that's become, at least for me, such an integral part of how I science now and how I just work and like find articles and find those kind of things and see people's opinions about things. And I think incorporating that again, provides this culture change to transparency towards commentary, towards feedback. Thanks. Great, great. Uh, so let, let me ask, squirt a little question in here for you, Amanda, because you're an assistant professor, rel relatively new in, in, the, in your career stage. Uh, so uh, what do you think about the risks involved in actually providing feedback um, publicly uh, to an established investigator? And do you think that that makes you vulnerable in some way? And does that, does that have an effect on the review that you would provide? Um, so I think I don't want to like negate this like view of criticism of like worry for things. So there's definitely retaliation and people definitely experience that. It's not something I've necessarily experienced sure. so far um, in terms of things that I think have been negative towards me specifically. And I think we have to accept the fact that that might happen. Um, and is that worth it um, to change the culture as a whole? Like, is it worth doing still? And I would argue, yes, that it's, you gotta be the change you wanna see in the culture. So even if we're sitting on the assistant professor side of things, you know, we can't wait for the system to dismantle itself. We can't wait for it to trickle down to us um, to a certain extent um, and wait for it to happen. We have to be active participants in it instead of um, hoping that someone more senior than us will do it for us. Great, great. You know, this really gets back to something that we may, I hope we'll get around to discussing later and that is you know, to, to effect culture change, who needs to change? 
Um, and I think that that's an important thing for us to be to be considering. Um, uh, Prachi, over to you. Yeah, so, um, you know, I do think that, um, you know, this is an interesting question about whether or not people feel nervous about either posting public reviews and um, whether, uh, you know, and, and even and receiving them, right? I think one of the big things that we hear from a lot of people is that, well, I don't know if the author wants me <laughs> to post the review. Um, and, you know, I, I will always argue that, you know, this is a public preprint on a, on a likely on a server that, that accepts comments and this, and it is a de facto, you know, request for, for public um, comment. And so I think it's just part of the, our cultural norms that we are sort of nervous about saying things publicly about work. And, you know, and I also think about, you know, whether or not are, you know, are we as, as, as transparent and as direct as we ought to be when we, when we say something publicly, or are we, you know, you know, excessively nice, you know, when we're saying some, you know, something publicly. And so that is, that is also this, you know, the other side of the coin is to not just be overly critical, but to be underly critical, um, you know, and just because there are all of these politics at play for how we interact with the work. Um, but I will say that, you know, my, I'm, I'm quite encouraged by, by, you know, listening to young people who are, who are thinking differently about, about, um, you know, whether or not they want to comment and post. And, um, and I, I have an anecdote that I can share about that later, but it's, it's really, um, you know, I think that all of us have a role to play in, you know, in, in, in posting feedback and is something that, that has a little bit of activation energy that, um, you know, we might be really, you know, it might be easy for us to sort of tweet something and say, hey, this is a great paper and, you know, I have this question, you know, and, and, and then to write a formal review, of course, is, is takes time and, and effort and energy. And it's something that we're not necessarily, you know, we don't necessarily feel comfortable making public. And, and I think some people may also not just feel, feel comfortable, um, you know, with their initial thoughts you know, that they aren't sure are, you know, they've spent, you know, the full considered time on to, to post it publicly. But I think if we sort of lower the activation energy to make sure that people are more comfortable doing this, um, you know, we, we, we can, um, you know, change the, the nature of, of the discussion and make, make people even more comfortable. Great. So, so those were great responses and it's great to hear people's experiences. Um, uh, you know, the last thing that Prachi said was looking for ways to lower the activation energy. In a way, what 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 she's saying there is that that there are barriers that have been established by the culture that we exist in, uh, by the various kinds of pressures that we uh, are under, and the policies that kind of govern um, uh, how our careers proceed. Um, uh, and so, what are the what are the barriers? What are the things that create that activation hill? Um, uh, and and uh, that really exists. Uh, so I'm just going to get like to get anybody to respond to what they see as the critical things that we would need to be looking at to affect the kind of culture change that we're looking at. We're, we're talking about. I mean, I'll just say two things. I think one thing that isn't a barrier is technology. I mean, Victor had a question or a comment in the chat which was related to can you do it privately versus publicly and there's, you know, and I think somebody replied saying you can always email the authors and the hypothesis plugin will allow you to do it direct to the uh, submitters, right? So there is the technology bits done or well, is, is pretty sophisticated. Um, I think what we could do is, you know, a lot of it re relates to incentives, doesn't it? You know, if you're incentivizing people taking the time to, and this is a big thing, isn't it? Actually viewing the scientific process as being a collaborative effort and review and feedback being part of that collaborative effort rather than it being a combative process. If we could reframe that and through incentivizing good citizenship, it sounds a bit weird to phrase it like that, but actually saying if you take the time to engage with these people to help them with their work and, and you know, then, then it will count towards something. And I, I'm not entirely sure how at institution level or funder level we would do that, but I know at a personal level, having commented on preprints, and given feedback on preprints, that has built like almost friendships for life, somebody said in the chat. But I have built really amazingly warm and positive relationships with people. And and try and you know, and, you know, can we codify that? Probably not, but all we can do is keep saying to people, there is this kind of good feeling you get from feeling that you're part of the collaborative scientific process. Yeah. Great. Yeah, I mean, I do think that we are we are a little bit ruled by fear. You know, I I get a lot of private 
uh, feedback on preprints. In fact, my entire process for how we publish papers is we post preprint preprints and actively solicit feedback from everyone, and right. um, and much of it comes back in, in you know either at a conference or or privately you know by email, and um, you know and all of it is useful. I mean, we use it to basically revise the paper and, you know, we do at least one or two rounds of revision before we ever submit to a journal. And it's, it's it immensely useful. And, and I think the thing that I, I personally should do is, is, is take that private feedback and make it public because, you know, I'm not the only one who's benefiting from that. Sure. Our paper is getting better, but for the reader, it's really important that, you know, that they see all of these important points that, and we are in fact addressing them, or if we, you know, for whatever reason, don't agree, we can say so. But I think that that really adds to the richness of the work and it really helps, you know, and actually makes it happen much sooner, right? Like we can, as we are going through the process of, of, you know, absorbing that feedback and deciding what to do about it, we can we can make all of that public. And I think that that is, um, that's that's a benefit to, to everyone. It's a benefit to us and to readers and, and to even have a more public conversation about it rather than it just being behind closed doors. So I think, you know, just changing the way we think about this and and not being afraid of, of you know, surfacing, you know, you know, valid points. I think that's that's something that we can all, you know, get more comfortable with just by, participating on both sides. So do you think it's really an individual, what was going to drive this is going to be individuals like you, uh, Prachi, who say, I get all this private feedback. It's actually very valuable um, in kind of progressing our own science, but also in revealing the way that science really moves forward, uh, is really getting, getting uh, other people's ideas on your work who kind of come at it from a different point of view or different perspective. Uh, even if, if even if they agree, uh, the kind of the shades of interpretation could be really critical. Um, uh, and, and so, does it moving this into the public framework, which we I think we all agree has value? What's going to drive that? Is it is it going to be something that individuals will just have to choose to do, as you do, Prachi, or or is it that um, we need to be thinking about policy changes that will will um, kind of increase it, increase the value? of going public. Yeah, yeah I think the, yeah, I think the answer is actually twofold. So, so of course I think all of these things are important and there there's a there's a place for everyone to push on this to make it go forward, you know. But I but I have always been more bottom up than top down and I really think that we have a lot of each and every one of us has a lot of uh, of power to do things that are, you know, um that are different and we can we can demonstrate but just by our example we can demonstrate the value of this in the way that we've already seen for for example like the public you know value of of comments on preprints, I mean, on, on COVID preprints, for example, we all know how important that is, right? So it's not that big of a leap for, for um, you know, people to sort of understand why it's important and see that. But if, but, you know, I think at all stages, you know, this is one of the reasons that from when I was junior, I was trying to be very public about it so that people felt like, oh, well, you know, because it's really easy to say like, hey, that person's like senior and established and they don't have to worry about anything good, you know, easy for them to say, you know, and so I thought it made a difference to do it as a, as a you know, a junior woman of color and saying like, yes, this is not, it's not without risk. But I think that again, like Amanda made the really, really great point that, you know, it, it, is it worth it, right? Is it worth it for us as a, as, as scientists to move um, in the direction that we want to see, it, um, you know, this public discourse and, 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 you know, conversation go. So I think there's roles for both of those things, but also, you know, not just from policy, but also from um, making it easier, right? And I think there are a lot of uh, ways in which um, you know, many different organizations and institutions and funders are, are trying to make it easier, right? So people talk about incentives, but there's also, you know, just, you know, we're doing hard jobs that, you know, sometimes just like a little bit of friction makes, <laughs> makes, makes, um, makes something that is possible feel impossible. So I think we can, you know, do things individually policy changes are important, but we can also just, you know, tech, you know, not just technologically, but, but make it, um, make it easy uh, conceptually for people to do this, um, where it sort of works already in their workflow, for example. So Mike Eisen points out in the chat that, that while, you know, there's a lot of power in individuals taking on these um, uh, responsibilities that, that many people are going to feel uncomfortable without, the, without feeling that the institution is supportive. Um, uh, so, so, and, and Amanda, I saw you nodding as Prachi was talking, um, uh, and, and so this is, as a relatively uh, newcomer to the profession, uh, how do you feel about this and taking actions yourself, and, and do you feel that there's a real need for institutional backing 
or providing rewards um, and recognition for uh, engaging in these kinds of public activities? I think like we get a little bit into the like chicken and the egg scenario here, right? What comes first, the cultural change that makes it normalized or the policy decisions that force it to be normalized kind of thing. And I think I was listening like to Chris's last comment and Prashi's here. I think what I've learned in the first two years of being an assistant professor, I think we all know a colleague who probably doesn't pull their weight on service with yeah. our contracts. Really? And do you really want to be that person in your culture of academia? And um, your field and that kind of stuff? Are you gonna just like let that fall to everyone else? Cause we all know that stuff has to happen. That all has to, people have to do that to make our institutions, our universities and stuff function. Um, we gonna let that go to other people and just let them carry you forever. I, I think we, we all have experience with that. So <laughs> let's put it into this space. Absolutely. Chris, look, you look like you're about to say something. Uh, no, I was just I was just laughing at Amanda's <laughs> comment about the, the colleague. Great. So so um, uh, you know this is really gets to that question that I posed earlier of, of if we're going to affect change, who needs to change? Um, and this is kind of a broadly social uh, societal uh, question about culture change. Um, uh, whether it's the vulnerable people who have to just sort of suck it up and get with it. Um, uh, or the senior people that really need to, to set the standard? Or is it really everybody, individuals across the spectrum uh, that really need to, to, to do something? Um, and I, and I th when we start thinking about action steps coming out of this meeting, I think that's an important thing for us to consider. Uh, what are people's thoughts about this? Is it, is it the, the lead people, institutions, funding agencies uh, need to change the culture to create rewards? Um, I, I'm actually, um, co-chair of a, of a National Academies panel on aligning incentives for open science. And it's one of the questions that we really think hard about. And so, you know, I'm, 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 I know I'm gonna extract a lot of value from this meeting uh, on that question, but what are people's general thoughts of, of whose responsibility it is uh, to effect change? Is it everyone, uh, do, do, do we stack, have to stop calling on the vulnerable people to, to as I said, to suck it up and get with it? Uh, or uh, uh, should it really be the, the senior people, the institutions that begin to set new standards, create reward and incentive structures that will really move these things forward? Uh, any thoughts about that on the panel? I, I mean, I'll, I'll just say something. I just think that, I just think it's, absolutely inappropriate to kind of consider that the people of the least agency should be the ones to kind of um basically risk themselves on this i think it's for people like me and maybe some people who are tenured to who are willing and able to stick their neck up and kind of try and fight for a better tomorrow for those people who are incoming i think it's really problematic to kind of just say you know you people this is how it's always been it was tough for me this is how we always had a dissemination framework <laughs> You know, it's and 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 and, and the, the way I argue against this is if you look around academia, it's a monoculture, right? We we basically have effectively a monoculture. So if that is the most appropriate culture in terms of demographic, we we if that's what we need to solve all of the world's scientific problems, then fine. But I think it's not, and that means that the systems we've had before. So I think a lot of it should be posed around that. You know, that we 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 currently do not have the re the requisite diversity because the tools we've used and the metrics as well, well this isn't a metrics forum but the tools we use and the way we've interacted scientifically historically haven't been appropriate or haven't been a way of engaging um everyone great can um, i just say sorry keith can i just respond to chris briefly just to just to make please. this point that you know the thing i find very frustrating is the finger pointing where you know of course we all recognize that the people of power should use it for good but the number one excuse i hear from people in power is that they are looking out for their you know their trainees and that that is and on behalf of the trainees they are going to not take risks and not put their work out publicly and there is this massive you know gridlock in which nothing can happen because it's always somebody else's problem and if we can't take personal responsibility if every single one of us and this is not to put extra burden on anyone who's young but each and every one of us has to make it clear where we stand for you know what what it is that we want to see and just so that you know so our 
you know, PIs can't blame it on us, you know, just to say that this is what I want and um, to make it very clear that the, the, all those barriers are removed for everyone, right? So that um, that finger pointing can't happen. And and those people in power can can feel free to to do, you know, to, you know, use their leverage. <laughs> great, great. Um, Richard Seaver has been active in the chat as everybody has seen and he's got his hand up. So Richard. Um, yeah, I just uh, on that point, I just want I mean, I would echo everything that Chris and Prachi said there. Um, uh, but I think it's really important that it's not just preprints and it's not just peer review. There's lots of areas in which um, the scientific community kind of points fingers, points fingers at journals, points fingers at, you know, sort of the desires of their postdocs. And it wasn't like it when I was young, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But, you know, and all of these things reveal that, you know, it all comes, we say this time and time again, it comes down to incentives, right? It comes down to incentives. That's why everybody's obsessed with impact factor. That's why um, people are obsessed with journal name because they think people use this in hiring and that's the incentive. And, you know, I hate to say it, people do use it, you know? And so the, the only people who can change that are the people at the top, are the people who are the decision makers. Who are, and, and I think that's that's what we have to do. I mean, I think obviously from the grassroots up, people should be involved. But I think really anybody who in a position where they can control decision making in hiring, um, those are the people who can do most. And they have to take this on board. I think saying, you know, everybody should do their part. And, you know, it's great that early career researchers do this. It's, it's really kind of like potentially hanging them up to dry if large numbers of um uh, uh, sort of hiring and other organizations are not really doing this. I mean, we had a discussion yesterday on Twitter about this, where, you know, one university that shall remain nameless is only giving people open access um, fees if it's an impact factor above eight journal. You know, I mean, it's, it's things like that. You, you've got to change that all the way through. It's all about incentives. And that's where you have to start, in my view. Terrific. So we, this has been outstanding uh, discussion. Uh, we are out of time um, and, and I don't want to take a bite out of uh, the next uh, session. So um, uh, Jessica, do you want me to just hand this off to Anna or do you have something to? Oh, no, please. Uh, that was fantastic. I just wanted to thank all of the panelists for their fantastic contributions and uh, I look forward to this next session. I, I also want to echo that and, and thank the thank the panelists. Really great and 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 terrific chat conversation as well. So, uh, Anna, off to you. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Jessica. Thank you, Keith. Um, so I'm delighted to moderate our next discussion and really explore what some organizations are doing to support public preprint feedback. Um, so during this session, we're gonna hear from leaders of different programs that are supporting preprint review at various types of organizations, publishers, academic institutions, um, and they're gonna sort of discuss their motivations and experiences and provide some advice on how to get involved. So I'm really excited to be joined by Helen Robertson, the Prelites Community Manager at the Company of Biologists, Michael Lacey, the Curation Manager at the American Society for Cell Biology, James Frazier, a professor at UCSF, and Fabio Palmieri, a postdoctoral researcher at the University of Neuchâtel. Um, so each speaker is gonna give a brief presentation that will then be followed by a group Q&A after the last presenter. Um, but please feel free to start asking any questions you might have in the chat during the presentations. So our first speaker is going to be Helen Robertson. Like I said, she is the Prelites Community Manager at the Company of Biologists. Um, and for those of you who don't know, Prelites is a preprint highlight service that's run by the biological community and is supported by the Company of Biologists. Um, so Helen, please take it away. Anna, and thanks you know, for inviting me to speak today. So um, as you said, Prelites is a preprint highlighting initiative that is supported by the Company of Biologists. Um, and as Amanda already mentioned, we launched in early 2018 with two main objectives. And they were to bring interesting new highlights to the biological community that might have been missed from a, from a preprint server, and also to provide a public platform for preprint discussion. And you can see from this uh, infographic, gives a nice kind of overview of how that works in our prelites community. So at the heart of prelites are our community of prelighters, and they are early career researchers who advocate for preprints, but who also want to 
you know, gained some experience in science communication and writing about new research. So pre-writers select preprints from any preprint server, it doesn't matter which one, and then they write a news and views type digest of that preprint as a pre-light post, which is posted on our website. And we're not prescriptive about what that pre-light post looks like. It tends to include some background to the preprint and the research, the key findings of the preprint, but the two things that we're really enthusiastic about and like to include is the opinion of the pre-lighter, so why they chose this research, why it's interesting to them, and why they think it might be interesting to other people, and also questions they have for the author about the preprint itself. And those questions always get sent to the preprint author, and any comments that we have from the author, any answers to the questions, are published at the bottom of the pre-lights post on the website. If we go to the next slide, please. Thank you. So in the vast majority of cases, we find that preprint authors are really uh, you know, glad to have had their work highlighted by pre-lighters and they're happy to answer the questions that are raised. Um, about two thirds of our pre-lights posts have author comments, which we're really happy about. And you can see on the left-hand side here, I've just taken some, screen, some screenshots from Twitter showing uh, how glad those preprint authors are to have been featured on pre-lights and engaged with pre-lighters. Um, and I think that's another really interesting aspect of pre-lights is that this talking to the authors, sending their questions to the authors, facilitates an interaction between early career researchers and more established PIs that might not have happened were it not for writing this pre-lights post. And I think that's a really positive thing to come out of pre-lights as well. And on the right hand side, and I know this has been discussed in the previous session as well, although the nature of pre-lights questions are not necessarily what you might find in a peer review, these are more conceptual questions talking about the future implications of work. Nonetheless, those questions still seem to be really valuable and can help improve manuscripts and help preprint authors think about their findings in a different way, which is not just a testament to the questions that our preliders ask, but as has already been mentioned, it's a really positive outcome of talking about preprints in a public way, and that's something that we've definitely seen with preliders as well. So thank you for asking me to talk and I'll hand over to the next panelist. Wonderful, thank you so much, Helen. Um, so next we're gonna hear from the curation manager at the American Society for Cell Biology, Mike Lacey, um, who's gonna tell us about the development of significant statements and badges as a way to provide public preprint feedback. Mike. All right, thanks. And thanks so much for such a great event and excellent discussions already. So, um, so as Anna mentioned, I'm working at the ASCB alongside our journal, Molecular Biology of the Cell, where we're kind of thinking about this project as a way to expand the role of what an editor and what the journal can do um, to add to our publishing activities and include curation of preprints. So soon uh, coming up this year, we'll be starting to publish preprint highlights that will be these short significant statements trying to kind of summarize and give a bit of background context and an editor's kind of opinion of what's the most interesting or most uh, important contribution of a, of a preprint, um, and also a selection of these visual badges that will kind of help to recognize important aspects of the research practice. Um, so that these will together serve kind of multiple purposes to improve uh, discovery and accessibility for bringing more authors to the preprint, allowing more people to potentially give their own feedback to the, the authors, you know, people in maybe not necessarily the particular expertise field that uh, might also find a work particularly interesting or, or relevant to their work, um, even if it wasn't something that they would have found on their own scanning a table of contents kind of thing. Um, so, and with, with all of this, um, the important thing, we want these to be kind of a, a structured way to recognize or, or provide kind of a trusted recommendation of the work. Um, so I'll point out we're, we're doing these, these kinds of things not uh, to kind of represent or replace the peer review of the preprint, but hopefully to, to encourage more readership and more activity around, around those works that our editors find interesting uh, for their communities. Um, so if we go to the next slide, uh, just real quickly, I'll mention that these highlights will be done by a new group of 24 early career researchers uh, who we've added to our editorial board earlier this year. Um, 
We selected these folks after an open call for applications, and I'll point out that we will have a uh, plan to have another call for applications uh, next winter. So, so we'll be looking to add additional people to do this. And I'll leave the, the last couple of points maybe for later in the discussion, but I do wanna point out that, you know, one of the challenges to doing projects like this at an institutional level and not just encouraging individuals to take actions is that these things do require funding you know, building out new tools or adding things to a website um, or just getting somebody to coordinate these kind of things does take uh, some funding. And we're fortunate to be supported right now by a grant from the Wellcome Trust and HHMI. Uh, and we hope that this will be a, a long-term, more sustainable activity for the journal. So thanks. Thank you so much, Mike. Um, so now, we heard a little bit from what sort of societies and publishers are doing to support public preprint feedback. And we're gonna shift gears to think about some of the ways that academic institutions are doing this. Um, so please, I'm pleased to have um, James Fraser, uh, like I said, a professor at UCSF, um, who's gonna present next and sort of and share what he has learned through incorporating peer review into teaching. Um, yeah, so I think, uh, you know, one of the, the differences about the last two experiments and this experiment is this does look a lot like journal organized peer review. The form of this is essentially identical uh, to uh, journal organized peer review. Um, and, and I think that, you know, open reviewing that looks like journal organized peer review is important uh, at many levels. I, I'm really interested in pushing the envelope on uh, the faculty level incorporating review activity into promotions and hiring. Uh, but it's always important to start uh, young because they're the easiest to, to change. Uh, and so one of the experiments we've been running uh, is doing this uh, in some of the graduate courses at UCSF and in particular uh, some mini courses, which are three week courses that we have at the end of our first year. Uh, and I teach one on uh, peer review, uh, where we talk about what does a good peer review look like? What are the trends in peer review? And uh, then, uh, you know, have the students actually write peer reviews on preprints. And one of the big lessons I have is that you have to, uh, when you undertake this, you have to do uh, something really important, which is, you know, actually mentor the students. Uh, teach them how to give good constructive feedback because it, they are already infected by the gatekeeping mentality of peer review uh, before they've even joined a lab. Uh, and so how to give constructive feedback uh, is, is something that, that requires a lot of effort and it requires the instructors acting uh, really as, as very engaged editors. Uh, some other big lessons that, that I've had out of, uh, out of this class is that it's really effective to pair students. Uh, they, they work better uh, in pairs. It helps sort of decide, uh, embolden people to actually realize that questions aren't stupid, uh, that, that maybe things need to be clarified. Uh, just having the realization that other people are having the same questions, one other person. Um, as I mentioned already, Emphasizing constructive feedback, not gatekeeping, requires, on my part, multiple iterations of engaging with the students. And so instructors, if you're going to assign reviews as part of your course, you need to roll up your sleeves as well and really get in there for textual edits. It's a lot more like, uh, you know, grading uh, an essay for English literature or something, providing feedback like that. Than, than sort of the yes or no answers that we're used to for a lot of, uh, a lot of our science uh, classes. Um, another important aspect is that you can use this to test out how important anonymity is for early career researchers. If you don't list the folks who are in the course on the website uh, or anywhere publicly, and you're willing to post the review, I can just say it's posted by James Fraser on behalf of some students who wish to remain anonymous. Uh, and in my most recent iteration of this class, one out of the six teams chose anonymity and five out of the six teams chose to, uh, to name themselves. And then the final thing is you can tag the authors after posting. You tag them on Twitter or email them and the response has been universally positive. People are so hungry for feedback. 
uh, especially constructive feedback. Uh, even when they find out, as Steve Shea did here, that he made kind of a silly mistake in fundamental brain anatomy that he, you know, is sort of embarrassed about. But he was so happy and sent me a nice note afterwards privately about just what a great experiment it was. Um, and so uh, as, as uh, you know, this, this becomes more common, as I think it will, we should really try to use teaching as one of the easiest ways to infect the young with this attitude. And as you're doing it, just recognize it's going to require hard work on your part as well. You're not just going to be able to assign some preprints and, and walk away. And with that, I will pass it to uh, the next exciting speaker, Fabio. Or back to Anne. Thank you so much, James. It was great hearing about your experiment. Um, and I'm delighted now to hear from Fabio, um, who's going to tell us about his work setting up a preprint journal club. So thanks a lot, Anna, for the introduction. And also, I would like to thank uh, Jessica for the invitation. So I'm really pleased to talk to you about uh, my initiative, with the, which is kind of uh, similar to James one, but uh, at the level of the doctoral program. So basically, why I wanted to set this preprint journal club um, at my doctoral prog program is because as a career researcher, we lack training of peer reviewing. And I thought that also that would also benefit uh, in feedback on preprints. And so I, approach, I approached um, the coordinators of um, my doctoral program. Uh, so these here, the doctoral program in microbial sciences and also the doctoral program at my universities and they were both super excited excited about the idea. So really the first step I did was, uh, so I created a journal club activity, a preprint journal club activity um, that was um, uh, built like that. So I first uh, gave a presentation of as a bio and preprints in general, um, and really informations about their pros and concern. And then I introduced Preprint Journal Club and also their benefits for the communities and the student training. And then we did a preprint review with the attendees. And so that was, so my, uh, my dream outcome out of this activity was like to create Kind of a snowball effect because in this doctoral program we come from um, uh, many universities of the Swiss uh, of the western part of, of Switzerland and so I mean the feedback at the end of the attendees was really positive I'm not sure they uh, set up a preference journal club at their institution yet but um, I will I think we iterate the, um, so we do the activities in uh, next year. And then if you go to the next slide, please. So then the next step was really to create this preprint journal club at the, the doctoral program in my universities, in my university. So what I thought is that to make it compulsory for PhD students enrolled in the program, so like as a requirement to get graduated. And I mean, that should not be quite a big problem because for example, um, in order to get graduated at the end, we have to, uh, for example, uh, attend um, a meeting. Uh, so done by the PhD students of the program and also present at least one poster. So. I think it will it will be positively uh, accepted as a, as a rule, and also what I also uh, already talked about with the coordinator is to work in pairs, so that one PhD student presents and the other is helping to taking note notes, and then so we also so because I also presented that at the faculty level. 
and they were also suggesting to have at least like one postdoc or also or one professor like to kind of moderate the discussions around the preference and then of course all the students will uh, help to um, write the, re the review and then um, the results ongoing discussions on how many credits will be granted for that activities because we have to have like uh, 12 credits at the end of our PhD and yeah so that's uh, still in ongoing discussions thanks thank you so much Fabio and thank you to all of the speakers we have a couple minutes left for Q&A so if you have any questions please feel welcome to drop them into the chat I think one thing that I was picking up on through all of these presentations is that these are all um, sort of slightly different forms of peer review, um, or sort you know they differ slightly from traditional peer review. Um, so I'm wondering, sort of what are your takes on that in sort of the type of feedback you're getting, how that compares to the traditional peer review, um, and sort of pros, cons, benefits, disadvantages. So happy to have any of the panelists weigh in here, of course. Um, I can go ahead if you like. Yes, please do. Yeah, I guess I touched on this a little bit. So um, the pre-lighters questions, as I said, they tend to be more conceptual or talking about how this research fits into you know, future research prospects or what's in the literature already. So they're not critical of methods, things like that, that you might expect to see in peer review. They're more highlighting whether they're interested in and not picking it apart from that perspective um, but I think that still has its benefits you know as we saw that those kind of comments and those kind of questions can still help preprint authors think about their work in a different way so I think there's a space for both kind of discussions both kind of questions um, and certainly I think that fits in with what the other panelists are saying as well. Thank you Helen and I think so James, you, you are saying that yours is probably the most like traditional peer review, um, but I was still, I think one of the major differences is that you were sharing that on Twitter. Um, did you learn anything specific from, from the experience of doing it so publicly in that way? Well, you know, that's exactly how my lab does it anyway for uh, journal organized peer review. So, you know, it's, it's, for me, it doesn't actually seem any different. We post all our reviews publicly. I'll often, you know, tag or or uh, write a you know TLDR one sentence summary when we do a, a new review. Uh, so that part didn't didn't seem uh, that different. But again, I've been very critical of papers in 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 that context. The students were very critical of some of the papers, yet the response was always positive. People, you know, people are uh, adults. They're ready to hear feedback, uh, and and if it comes from a place of, uh, you know, we really did not understand how this claim <laughs> relates to this evidence, they're willing to either change the claim, provide more evidence, or provide a better explanation. Uh, and so that that lesson, uh, you know, to get that into students early. I think is really important. And it's not about a binary. This is, you know, going to make it to this journal or it's not because those those things don't line up, but that the paper can evolve uh, is really what I want the students to take away from the class. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Um, so I have just a couple of minutes left and I, I want to continue along this theme of um, differences from public preprint feedback and sort of the traditional peer review. So thinking about sort of the technology and infrastructure element. Um, I'm wondering maybe, Mike, if you could speak to the tension between sort of building new technology and using new technology, um, especially because it seems like the significant statements and the badges might have required some a different infrastructure at least. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I think part of, part of the, the challenge we created for ourselves is that we had um, very specific ideas of how we wanted to incorporate these things into our journal content. You know, we didn't just want to 
let loose a bunch of people to go and post their comments on BioArchive, which they certainly can, or just go and email the authors very quietly. We wanted these to be um, formalized in a way in our, our journal. And of course, you know, manuscript submission systems, publishing sites and hosting on the website, all of these things are very specifically tailored to a journal research article that has a very set kind of structure and a very set kind of workflow and um, you know, adding new tools and components to that is, is always a bit of a challenge. Um, but I think fortunately we've been able to, to work through you know, our vision of what we want things to look like and have lots of good discussions from a conceptual standpoint and also from a technical standpoint of, of how, how these things should work and um, where, they'll, where, where they will appear and how they can be used. Great, thank you so much. And thank you, um, I see we're at the top of the hour. So thank you to all of the panelists. Um, I learned so much from your presentations and I look forward to the rest of the meeting and I'm happy to pass it back over to you, Jessica. Thank you so much, Anna. Thanks to all the panelists. It's really inspiring to hear about these initiatives. Um, and as you've heard alluded to by several speakers, one of our main goals with this meeting is to not only talk about the issues at play, but also help different stakeholders take concrete action to promote a culture of positive uh, criticism and constructive review on preprints. So we have assembled at the meeting website, asapbio.org slash feedback ASAP, a uh, list of different concrete actions that you can do if you're an author, as a reader or a reviewer, or perhaps as a representative of a journal. Um, so you know, clearly I think the most obvious one um, is to go post those comments, go, go post those reviews. Um, but, you know, I think another one that I would just like to ask Mike Eisen, uh, since I know that you know, he's present, um, one thing that we have highlighted here is submitting to a journal or service that posts reviews on preprints. Um, and certainly Review Commons uh, does offer that option, which is a collaboration uh, between ASAP Bio and Embo. Um, but eLife has enacted some new policies that I think um, are, uh, uh, take this a step further. Mike, would you like to jump in here for a few seconds and describe sure. what you're doing? I mean, we decided quite a while ago that we wanted to fully embrace the preprint review model. And so over the last year, we've transitioned everything in our editorial process to be built around that. And I should say, like, we've been working really closely with BioArchive and Richard to make this happen. The, you know, basically what happens now at eLife is people su submit papers to us if, um, if we decide to send it out to review as of July 1st, that paper has to be posted as a preprint. If the authors didn't do it, then we will do it for them. So everything we now review is an article that um, it, it exists as a preprint. And the reason for doing that is that we want to post public reviews of everything we've, we've, um, we've reviewed. And so over the last really six months, we've transitioned our editorial process completely to you know to, to center the production of preprint reviews as part of that as part of that um process so every paper we review we now you know the, the sort of first thing our reviewers and editors produce is a public review of that preprint and that you know you know it's been a little bit of a a learning experience for us all because you know it's a very different thing to write a review that's meant to be both useful for the public and something that that won't you know you know, that's written in a way that isn't isn't is appropriate for a public discourse or you know around around the paper. And so I think I, I've been really impressed at how everybody's kind of embraced that idea. And and you know, pretty much everybody's been enthusiastic about about that process. I think reviewers have felt that they're being, you know, they're being challenged to write things in a different way, but they're also making their reviews more useful and thoughtful. And I think the editors, despite some concerns about it being more work, have largely embraced this this process. The feedback from authors has been almost universally um, positive about the about the experience. And you know, this is now where we're at. We are now a, um, a journal that only reviews preprints and it, where every single paper we review, the preprints, the reviews end up um, both on BioArchive and on our own um, platform we're creating to try to make this process work, work more smoothly. So I think, you know, this is this is the future. We agree completely, and and um, eLife is one hundred percent 
uh, behind this. And, you know, there's an increasing number of preprint reviews that are out there in the in the real world that are coming from eLife as well as many of the other people in this meeting. And I think we're, we've crossed kind of a little bit of a threshold here where, where this has gone from being kind of a niche, a niche activity that doesn't really have any, um, any visibility to being something that is increasingly going to be part of the ethos and culture of, of publishing. So yeah, we're excited. I'm excited for this meeting. Thanks. Thanks for organizing it. And it's next year is going to be awesome in this, in this space as more people get behind it and as more people start to see their papers handled in this way. So. Thanks so much, Mike. Um, uh, yeah, it'd be fantastic to see uh, other journals and services moving in this direction. Um, and just to, as a reminder, we do keep a list of some of those additional services that are provided as public reviews at Reimagine Review, which is uh, coordinated by Victoria Yan, uh, who's at this meeting as well. And you can access that listing uh, from this page as well. Um, but I do want to highlight in the next few minutes a few uh, additional steps that you can take. So one of the easiest things that in addition to, of course, providing comments, making comments, providing reviews on preprints, one thing that many of us, I think, um, in this call might be positioned to do is to simply uh, publicly invite feedback on your preprint. Now, this, of course, is something that many people are already doing on Twitter. Uh, though I think you can make the argument that posting it as a comment directly on the preprint itself can help even more people know that feedback is welcome. This is a really simple, easy way to encourage a culture of feedback, to let people who are potentially considering leaving a comment know that you uh, and your co-authors welcome this kind of discussion. Uh, I think that you know, some of the questions that people might have when posting a comment, is this going to be useful to the authors? Um, is this you know, coordinating with the timeline of their journal publication or submission. What type of feedback are they looking for? And are they okay with public feedback? Those are things that could potentially even be addressed in this request for feedback. So we are um, just monitoring bioarchive comments as well as tweets um, and collecting some examples of these requests for feedback on the meeting website. Um, uh, and you know, this is, I think, just I see Philip's uh, you know point here. I, I I definitely think that there is a uh, you know this is a way to reduce that energy barrier and uh, make it even easier for people to jump into the discussion. So now I'm very pleased to announce today that we are launching the Preprint Reviewer Recruitment Network. Um, this is a way for researchers to share their preprint uh, reviewing and feedback experience as work samples with journals who are looking uh, to expand reviewer pools and editorial boards. So there is, uh, you know, you've often heard people talk about the reviewer crisis that uh, journals are in need of identifying um, uh, new individuals to act as expert peer reviewers or serve on editorial boards. At the same time, um, we've heard calls for more recognition uh, and awareness of, of preprint feedback. So this initiative seeks to bring together um, these, these two issues by allowing researchers to self-identify, even if the review is provided anonymously, even if they co-wrote a review, um, even if it's simply a comment to basically attach all of that information that might appear across different platforms to information about their position and their interests, their keywords, their uh, publication history, et cetera. We are thrilled to have 30 journals, um, which you can see here, as well as uh, several from the PLOS family and the SAGE family, and one platform, Review Commons, uh, who are uh, together committing to this six-month pilot. And we're going to be evaluating this over um, the next several months to identify whether it's useful, how many people are being invited, what we can do to even enhance this um, and uh, make it more useful to both researchers and journals. Uh, we would love to have additional journals join as well. So please do follow up with me um, if you might be interested in that. Uh, I want to also introduce my colleague, Hirachi Puebla, who will tell you about another initiative that we just got started on. Yeah, hello everybody and thank you so much Jessica and thanks to everyone who has spoken already fantastic discussions. Um, I just wanted to uh, provide a brief overview of another initiative that we are planning and which we 
we'll likely announce later this week, so you're getting a brief uh, advanced preview. Um, we have been thinking about ways uh, to encourage participation in preprint review aligned with everything that has been discussed today already. We are keen to get more early career researchers involved and try to address some of the potential concerns um, that again, many others already today have discussed as to whether the authors would welcome uh, the comments, whether those who are participating feel confident in providing reviews and all of these issues around potentially signing public comments and reviews. So we thought we could try um, an experiment with a new mode of peer review, and we've been inspired um, in relation to this initiative by um, a project that has been pioneered uh, at a chemistry journal called Sinlet. Uh, they started running um, a different peer review uh, approach in parallel to their traditional review process. At the journal, um, I think they started around three years ago, and what they did was create a, what they call a select crowd of reviewers, a group of reviewers who get sent papers and asked to comment um, rapidly in a few days um, on the paper that they, they have been sent. So we wanted to see if we could potentially transpose this to uh, the review and feedback on preprints, and we are going to be running a three-month trial. Uh, focus on, on, again, the circulation of uh, preprints. We're starting specifically with one discipline because we wanted to pilot this and see um, how it operates. So we'll start with uh, papers on the cell biology category and bioarchive. And we also wanted to keep this to a manageable level. So one or two preprints per week. We are going to be organizing a crowd of reviewers. So a group of reviewers who are interested in providing this feedback. Um, and participating based on their expertise and availability. Um, and we hope to, again, get this started as soon as we, we get the crowd going. So in the next slide, I'm going to just uh, give a very brief overview of how the workflow looks like in broad terms. Um, we will be, so we, Ace of Bio will be selecting the papers and we will take this step of contacting the authors of the preprint to check uh, that the, essentially make them aware of the initiative and check if they are happy for their paper to be included. And then once we get that confirmation, we will circulate the preprint to uh, this crowd of reviewers. We are going to be using the hypothesis uh, tool for commenting. So this would be through a private uh, hypothesis group where all of the uh, reviewers as part of the crew will be part of, and we will be asking them to comment uh, for a period of seven days, after which we will close that commenting period. Obviously, they are free to comment separately if they wish, but for the purpose of our approach, uh, we will close the commenting period at, at that point, and we will proceed to create a synthesis of all the comments collected. And the idea here is not necessarily to do any edits in a kind of traditional editorial role, but mostly to provide a report for ease of uh, public readers, because we will be planning to have the public record of that activity as a review posted through the uh, Transparent Review in Preprints uh, framework on BioArchive. So on the next slide, uh, I just wanted to uh, mention that we have already information on the uh, trial available on the website with much more detail than what I cover here. I encourage you to check the information there or feel free to contact me again through uh, Zoom or, or separately, I'm happy to pro provide more information. We will also be calling for public participation. So I've provided the link there for anyone who may wish to sign up. And if you are not available, but have a colleague, please let them know. Um, and again, if you have any queries, please feel free to get in touch with us. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, and I now want to introduce Bodo Stern from HHMI, who will be commenting on how institutions can recognize yeah. these images. So yeah, I want to um, uh, present an idea that speaks to what several people have already brought up. What can funders and research institutions do to change the incentives? What can be done from the top um, to incentivize uh, public review of preprints? And I wanted to share an idea with you that we are actually really excited about, uh, but it is really just this at the moment, it's an idea. But I think it's an idea that is um, ready for, for your input, what you like about it, what you think is problematic about it. Now, the idea is the action that we think funders should consider taking is to endorse the inclusion of refereed preprints as peer-reviewed articles 
in the applications that uh, scientists submit uh, for funding and um, for, yeah, for funding and, and employment decisions. Now, the motivation for this action is really the experience with preprints. Um, I think funders were relatively early out of the gate to endorse preprints. And um, that did two things. It legitimized preprints. It helped to legitimize preprints. And it, I think it also helped to overcome concerns from scientists that preprinting would lead to scooping and to problems with publishing in journals. And we hope that endorsing um, the public review of preprints could likewise also help to overcome barriers in, uh, uh, with, with refereeing um, uh, public peer review of preprints. Now, the philosophy that underlies this action, I think that can be summarized in the sentence that is here, the bottom of the slide. We believe that the process of ref referee preprints is superior to the process that currently happens at journals, the peer review process that is private, because referee preprints include the or publish the full peer review history. I think, I, I mean, I can see the writing on the wall that journals will jump on the bandwagon of transparency of peer review. And ma many of course have already done this by saying we publish the peer reviews of accepted papers. You know, that has already happened for many journals. That was a great first step. We think that this is not good enough anymore because the peer reviews of accepted papers are of course mostly positive because that's what led to an acceptance. And if we just limit transparency to accepted papers, I think we run the risk that transparency and peer review become, will become an advertisement for authors and for journals. So that's why we feel really strongly that we need to figure out a way to push towards the publication of all peer reviews and, and actually supporting as funders and institution referee preprints um, is a step that we think is really worthwhile to exploring and then really welcome your feedback on on this idea. Thank you. All right, well, welcome everyone back from the uh, breakout rooms. Uh, my job here is to um, hopefully not to butcher people's names too badly and to uh, keep track of time. So we're gonna have uh, reports from all the different breakout groups. And if I, if I do butcher your name, I apologize. I'm um, particularly sensitive to that. My name is rarely pronounced correctly. So uh, uh, let's just go ahead and get started with uh, 1A, how to foster a positive preprint uh, feedback culture from past principles to implementation. And that's uh, Irachi Puebla. Yes, thank you. So we had a nice discussion about different elements related to preprint uh, feedback culture. We focus on two elements. One is we discussed a little bit the fast principles um, that uh, a working group that is a bias coordinator and has developed uh, around, uh, again, to provide some guidance on the behaviors that we expect for constructed uh, preprint feedback. Uh, we requested feedback from the attendees on, on those principles. And there was some interesting comments on areas that we will discuss for clarification and additions. There were some comments about uh, the tension that can arise in this context of preprint feedback between, um, I think that the, what was referred to between being honest and being merciful. So how to be constructive, but still point out when there are any issues. Um, also comments about the fact that there is no mention specifically to journals uh, on the principles that refer to different actors, but no mention to the journals so that come into play. And also some comments as to, yeah, okay, we have some principles here, but what happens next was the moderation or the policy process around this. And then in the second part of the session, we took a more forward uh, looking approach and we um, asked everyone to position themselves in a future where there is a lot of preprint feedback happening in, in a constructive way and to try to think about things that would have driven us uh, there so that ha will have helped us get there and where these fast principles um, come into play. There were several comments to the importance of training and teaching uh, initiatives all tie into things that we heard earlier uh, today. Also the importance uh, of recognition, for example, for uh, job and grant applications, if preprint reviews were to be um, recognized as part of that. Um, we did ask um, 
everyone to think a little bit about what does this mean for early career resources, but the position was that probably we are a bit too early in the game and that that's something that will require is a specific consideration discussion for the challenges for early career resources. And then something else that I wanted to highlight from the discussion was that there was a suggestion that, again, given that we are quite um, early in this discussion and, and development of preprint feedback, we should think about any uh, principles um, uh, as something flexible and not too prescriptive where we, we get more comments and essentially take into account that uh, these principles and the approach may evolve in the future as we see more of this activity developing. So I hope I haven't missed anything uh, that everyone else may have thought important. I wanted to thank everyone who participated for their input. Great, and you finished with 22 seconds to spare. So um, you are a, a model. All right, so uh, next session, uh, session 1B, developing a taxonomy to describe preprint, the preprint review processes. Uh, this is uh, Victoria Yan. Hi, uh, in our breakout session today, we stress tested our uh, terms of uh, the draft taxonomy. So we have eight terms and we decided to apply this and test it on review comments. So the group noted that um, specific aspects of the entire paper uh, can be reviewed. So this is something that we didn't fully capture. So we had this distinction between reviewing specific aspects versus the entire paper. So um, we can uh, make this more clear. So another item that came up, and this is something that was very hotly debated in the taxonomy working group as well, which is uh, the declaration of a conflict of interest. So in our group, we discussed that um, potentially establishing a norm for uh, conflict of interest declaration is very important. So, um, and, but that should not mean not having the right to review. So in the context of preprints um, and preprint review services, how it is differently handled at different services that should be captured. And we also had an exercise where we uh, asked for where and how could the terms be useful. And we found that for readers, displaying the terms is important at the level of the associated reviews on the preprints. And for authors um, who requested review and whether public interactions are required are important aspects to see at the preprint review service level. And we also had many suggestions from the group to add additional levels and additional granularity to the taxonomy, but we decided that it was more important and more necessary for it to be simple in order to be widely adopted. So these are the main findings in our uh, breakout session. And I really want to thank everybody who came and um, participated in an amazing discussion. All right, fantastic. Um, all right, next is public preprint review as a tool to empower the next generation of socially conscious peer reviewers. And this is Mugda Sate, Rebecca Lijic, and Daniela Saderi. Thanks. I can summarize from our session. I'm Becky Lijek. So in session 1C on using preprint review to empower ECRs, we started with a conversation about who can be a peer reviewer, sort of challenging the traditional ideas of what we mean by expertise. And so we came up with a crowdsource definition that a reviewer is anyone participating in science willing to think deliberately, critically, and constructively about the work. And we talked about how the act of doing peer review, whether that's preprint or journal review, is what creates new peer reviewers. Then we talked about how we ourselves were trained in peer review, broadly agreeing that we weren't. Um, I presented some data showing that peer review training, formal peer review training is rare, and that the lack of training drives ECRs to ghostwrite reviews on behalf of their PIs. And I called for a paradigm shift to integrate authentic experiences in peer review, like frequent reviews into science education more broadly. We talked about how involving ECRs in preprint review not only improves their scholarly skills of critical thinking and writing, but it also broadens students' understanding of science to include communication and community engagement. And that preprint review also improves ECR's sense of belonging in science, which we know is really critical for recruitment and retention of BIPOC scientists and women and gender minorities in STEM. 
Um, Mugda shared some examples of how to teach peer review to undergraduates using her experience and shared some rubrics for evaluating uh, reviews written by ECRs. And then we concluded with a summary of the resources for preprint review that's provided by pre pre-review.org and their executive director, Daniela, took us through an exercise in challenging implicit biases and structural inequities in peer review. And in all, we agreed that all ages and career stages have an important role to play in peer review and that preprint review opens up new exciting opportunities for ECRs to learn and engage with the scientific community. All right, fantastic. Um, okay, our uh, next group, this is from the second session to a uh, posting journal reviews on preprints, and this is uh, Ludo Waldman, James Frazier, and Cooper Smote. Yes, let me give a brief summary of what we discussed. Um, so we uh, discussed the possibility of um, um, posting journal peer reviews, so invited reviews for journals, posting them openly uh, as a reviewer, um, at least when the article under review is also available as a preprint, or perhaps uh, more radically to actually uh, review for journals only if the article under review is also available openly as a preprint and to then post the review reports. Uh, we also discuss other forms of, of <coughs> focusing peer review more on preprints rather than on uh, submissions to journals. Um, at the same time, we also discussed mechanisms, mechanisms that could um, help us move in the direction of these new ways of doing peer review. Um, in particular, uh, Cooper, my co-organizer, uh, presented the work of Free Hour Knowledge, uh, the organization that he is uh, he's, uh, managing, which has set up a kind of uh, standardized way of organizing campaigns, campaigns to get broader support for these types of, of initiatives. And so some of the issues that came up in our discussions were, first of all, um, early career researchers that may not feel at ease in uh, moving in some of these di directions that we discussed, um, because, uh, for instance, they could not be anonymous and, and they may uh, fear the, the, the uh, consequences of, of, of being critical in, in, in publicly posted uh, reviews. Um, we discussed also the um, different roles of peer review, gatekeeping, which of course is an important thing that peer review does for journals, versus uh, constructive feedback and constructive discussion, which is the thing that probably most of us like more. Um, and essentially what we are proposing is also a shift from this gatekeeping role of peer review to this role of con giving constructive feedback. Um, so we had discussions on these issues, um, also the intrinsic motivations that people have to do peer review and how we can best make use of these intrinsic motivations, all these things. There seemed to be in our group uh, strong support for many of the ideas that were proposed, but some people also indicated that, that they could support them only in principle. And they felt that in practice at the moment, they were not able for different types of reasons to take certain steps. Um, so that makes clear that there is still work to be done in finding the right kind of pathways to uh, organize a certain transition. Thank you. All right, wonderful. Uh, and uh, now on to session 2B, curation review in the preprint landscape. This is Hannah Drury, Paul Shannon, and Gabon Anwuchekwa. Hi, um, yeah, we focused the discussion mostly on curation. Um, there was a lot of great points that came out of it. Uh, I think I'm going to highlight some of them. Um, when we asked the question, what makes curation useful? Um, There's so many great points. Um, one of them being like, it, it will help to highlight um, content for uh, non-experts. Um, it could also be used as a talent spotting, um, but most importantly, it could be a way to um, give attention to underrepresented researchers from from um, countries um, that are not within the Western society. Um, other co conversation was focused on what would motivate people about um, curating preprints. And I think um, some of the points like passion um, to draw attention to, to papers. Um, if there are resources, um, if we can do it together with other people, um, we have great points that came out of that. Um, but another issue that started when we asked about thinking of the 
the term curation, um, uh, it was compared to gatekeeping um, of, uh, of, a sort, of, of a sort, but someone else made a point that um, if it's that gatekeeping is separated or curation is separated from scholarly work, um, that can that could be overcome. So um, there were also points about bias and control um, because when some people curate work, they could use that to to hinder other work from coming up with, with as um, points like um, you know things like rigor and all those sort of things. So overall, there was um, positive um, um, take on curation, and a lot of people think they can do it, and it's useful and it's worth the while. Thank you. All right, fantastic. Um, and now on to our final uh, session. This is 2C, Tackling Information Overload, uh, Identifying Relevant Preprints and Reviewers. Hi, uh, yes. Um, so we had a, um, a mostly a discussive kind of breakout session, but Martin Fenner and I presented um, an idea that we uh, had to try and tackle information overload and identify relevant preprints as soon as they're posted. So the idea really in summary is to um, get a list so for researchers to realize a list of biomedical preprints that have been filtered by a minimal number of tweets in the days after posting and broken down by subject area. Um, and this would allow um, folks to find interesting new preprints um, relevant to themselves uh, with the minimal effort possible. I think um, in our breakout group, there was acknowledgement that this is certainly an issue that's been um, addressed for a long time. There are lots of people doing things in different ways. Um, and um, our approach was to really send out a newsletter broken down by subject area that people could sign up to and um, try and, um, and, and use this as a way to identify preprints in their area that they might want to read straight off and this would like really foster uh, the sense of um, speed with which information is disseminated. So what we were proposing is quite different from what's out there right now, even though many people are doing similar things. And um, we don't want to reinvent the wheel. Um, there was a sense that um, if we make something perfect, it's going to take forever. So uh, what we're going to do is um, email everyone that we think is relevant, um, an invitation to sign up to the newsletter and hopefully get um, feedback that way uh, on the very simple um, uh, product that we've come up with. Um, yep, I think that's pretty much it. I don't know if Daniel wants to talk about finding reviewers. Yeah, well, <clears throat> just quickly, um, so, um, Taking this uh, general theme of in information overload, I was basically looking at um, what does this mean for finding reviewers? <clears throat> and uh, I uh, looked at distinctions between classical manuscript review and uh, preprint review. I identified a number of opportunities where the preprints actually are in a better position to find reviewers, suitable reviewers, or to get uh, certain aspects of the preprint reviewed than what you can do in the more siloed uh, manuscript workflow. Um, yeah, and then we had a, a discussion. Some of those bits and pieces are just ideas. Some of them have actually been implemented in certain ways, and and now we'll, we'll see how this moves forward. All right, great. Well, thank you to all of the breakout uh, reporters for staying to time, and I'll turn it back over to uh, Jessica. Uh, thanks, Prachi, actually. Yep. Prachi, I, sorry, yep, Prachi. I got no problem. Uh, All go. right. <laughs> All right, so we are nearing the end of the program. So I just want to thank everyone who participated in this meeting and all of the people who have been working behind the scenes for um, months now, trying to prepare all of the different initiatives that we have going and, um, and all of the partners that we have. Um, uh, participating in this in, in this meeting. Um, and so please keep an eye on our um, website, asapbio.org and our newsletter. So we're gonna try and summarize, you know, everything that has been um, discussed here. Um, you know, you heard it sort of briefly just now, but um, we're gonna try and get everything together and have some blog posts that we put out. Um, Arache has mentioned that we are doing this crowd preprint review trial. 
um, that is going to you know, collect an, uh, a large number of people in the area of cell biology and identify preprints that are going to sort of be um, you know, reviewed together as a group and then consolidated in the form of um, a review and posted back to, um, to BioArchive. And so we're gonna pilot that for um, a number of months. And then the other uh, new initiative that we announced today is this preprint reviewer recruitment network that is um, basically using the, the actual product, the review to try and identify new um, people to be in reviewer pools and, and on editorial boards. So um, that way we can sort of um, remove that entire barrier of trying to figure out, you know, uh, who is qualified and who is who is not and who knows who and to literally let people take into their own hands um, the ability to review a preprint and, and submit that as, as, as evidence of their of their outstanding work so that they can be included in these reviewer pools. And we have a very large group of, and you know, thank you to all of our journal partners for agreeing to uh, participate in that and, um, you know, use those reviews as they see fit to identify new reviewers for their pool. Um, and yes, yeah, so um, obviously you can see all of the actions. We tried very hard to, on the front page of this um, feedback ASAP meeting. Um, uh, right on the front page is a list of things that we really wanted to collect that everyone, so authors, readers, uh, journals, they can do today to participate in um, open uh, preprint review and try to uh, promote this, this sort of culture, obviously, please do follow us on Twitter. Um, and the last thing I wanna close with is to really just say, um, I'm gonna tell you a small anecdote that happened to me yesterday. I was you know, traveling and I got a direct message from a young student, a graduate student, who was looking for advice um, because she was considering, she wanted some, um, some, some experience doing some review, but the uh, right paper had not come across the desk of her PI where she could you know, co-review with the PI. And she was really eager to participate in this and, and had come across a preprint that she thought was really interesting. And she had something you know, really important to contribute to reviewing this preprint. And she wanted some advice on, on, on posting that review and participating in the process. And you know, um, I just was, it, you know, very happy that that the student wanted to do this. So I just hope that, you know, maybe may we all be inspired by the sort of optimism and leadership of this student's example and, you know, help create the world of, you know, open, constructive, scientific discussion that we all want to live in. So, um, you know, I hope we all, we all have a role to play. I think each one of us can contribute to this and, um, and make sort of the, the culture a little bit better around this. So thank you again for, for coming and, um, uh, I know we will all be in touch and, and, and working on this together. So um, stay tuned for more coming from ASAP Bio. See you all.